It was suggested that uh, we look today at seven steps to soul winning. I have a book on how to write, but it was written by someone who was not a natural writer, and that's a good thing, but he had to figure out how to do it. Uh, it's like trying to learn the piano from someone who plays by ear. They say, well, you just sit down and do it. So learning the way to share the gospel is probably better learned from somebody who actually doesn't know how to do it. And that's why I qualify, because I'm not naturally an evangelist. But uh, here in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, we read that he who wins souls is wise. And uh, it certainly is true that it uh, purifies your life, it focuses your life, it motivates you, it gives you joy, um, it makes you feel that every day has purpose. It's a wonderful thing to be involved in regular soul winning. Uh, apart from the benefits, of course, of seeing people saved and uh, the, the pleasure of the Lord in winning people over through the testimony of his people. So there are huge benefits to soul winning. I think we all know that, but there are some steps that we need to take in order to come into the good of that. And that's what I want to think about as we look at the subject. So the first point is this. We need to move from being self-centered to being selfless. And uh, the reason I say that is we just did a video on the top 10 reasons that Christians don't witness. And the number one reason is I'm afraid of being rejected. But is that really a good reason not to witness? Uh, I've often said we wouldn't worry about what people thought of us if we realized how little they did. What people think of us, it's not going to matter a snap of the fingers. But what they think of Christ will determine their eternal destiny. So Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare. And if you're anything like me, you've fallen into that snare many times. But the second half of the verse says, whoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So when we go out to witness putting our trust in the Lord, uh, we're safe. Uh, he gives us a power uh, to, to move across the inertia. Uh, he gives us wisdom. He gives us answers that we didn't even know we had. Uh, he brings scripture to our mind. He moves in the heart of the person that we're talking to. It's, it's a safe thing to be in the center of God's will. And certainly witnessing is part of that center of God's will for all of us. Uh, let's remember that we're not talking about being a prosecutor, not talking about being a judge and jury, talking about to be a witness. And what is a witness? A witness is just somebody who tells what they know. That's all the Lord's asking us to do. So, that's the first step. And I think the second step is like it. We need to move from guilty to grateful. Um, you know, I used to think about great answers too late when I was at home that evening. and think, Ugh, I should have said that. And I would feel guilty all the time. And I realized this is wrong because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. His commandments are not grievous. There's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Why was I constantly feeling guilty? And then I realized that guilt is a very poor motivator. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, we read this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge that if one died for all, then all died, and that he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, that's a, an operative statement there, isn't it? Uh, we judge, Paul says, this is what Bill McDonald called the love and logic of Calvary. We judge that if one died for all, if Christ died for all, that means that we were dead and we had no life of our own. And he died for us and rose again so that we could have life. Well, what life do we have? Our life? No, it's his life. It's, it's I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. So if it's his life in me, then he gets to decide how it's to be lived. And so Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. So it's the idea that now Christians have 
uh, x-ray vision when they look at people where x is the cross and they look at people through the cross and so they don't see this obnoxious person, this person that cut them off in traffic, this person that's hard to get along with at work, this, this neighbor that's totally unreasonable. They look through the cross at these people and they see need. They see deep spiritual need. They see eternal destiny. They realize these people that live around me every day, they're going to be forever somewhere, heaven or hell. And I have the opportunity of telling them how to get to heaven. So. Uh, if we could move past guilt to gratitude and to realize he loved us, he died for us, he rose again, and he's given us his life, so we want to live his life the way that pleases him. You know, in 1 Peter 2, 9, this was a huge verse to me. Uh, it was very helpful in my process of, of beginning to share the gospel. Um, 1 Peter 2.9 says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises. And that word is the excellencies of the one who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I began to think this way. Okay, uh, you've probably heard my story before. I was a chicken. I, I was afraid to talk to people. Um, and I just felt guilty and frustrated. And one night I got down by my bed and I said, Lord, I'm a chicken. You know I'm a chicken. I know I'm a chicken. There's no use kidding about that. Uh, I'm not confrontational. I'm afraid to offend people. This isn't good. I want to be used by you. So if you can use chickens, I'm available. And I began to pray and ask the Lord to um, change my heart. And this verse was hugely helpful to me because what I realized was Christ and the gospel had excellencies. And the word excellent, of course, is used now as a comparative rather than a superlative. So a whole parking lot of excellent cars. Well, that's an improper use of the word because excellent means it excels all the others. There can only be one car out of all of them that's excellent, that excels all the others. So I began to think that way. And some of you have heard my little talk on the uniqueness of Christianity. That comes out of this verse. The things that you can only find in Jesus. The things that you can only find in the gospel. And so I prayed and said, Lord, when I go out into the day, I want to be thinking about one of these excellencies. What's so great about being a Christian? What's so great about Jesus? And if that was in my mind, then I'd say, now, Lord, please bring me into contact with someone who needs to hear this, who's open to hear this. And if you don't mind, um, let me have this opportunity by them bringing up the conversation. Now, it may seem like a crazy prayer, but I'll tell you something. Probably for three or four years, I never initiated a conversation about the gospel. But every time I prayed that prayer and I went out into the day saying, Lord, I'm really enjoying this idea about Jesus or about the gospel. I want to share it with someone. He would actually do that. And I can tell you lots of stories, amazing stories, about people who would ask me something that would trigger the opportunity for the gospel. So that's a tremendous thing, to move from this feeling of guilt and obligation to this joy and thankfulness and, and gratefulness and thinking about the excellencies of the gospel and why it's so great to be saved, to pass that on. Okay, number three, we need to move from passive to prayerful. Um, if you would have asked me, those many years ago. And by the way, I was traveling preaching at that time. I didn't know my neighbors' names. Uh, the only people I witnessed to were captive audience, somebody in the, in the plane that couldn't get away. But the, the, the idea of developing relationships and getting to know people and sharing with people you know, I stayed away from that stuff. That's where the greatest impact is. These are people who know me and they should know I care and they watch my life. So I have the greatest advantage with people like that. So if you had asked me in those days, okay, put a gun on my head. Okay, tell me 10 people you desperately want to see saved. I'd be stuck. 
I might think of my uncle Russ or a couple people that, that in our family, you know, but, but I, I really wasn't passionate about that. And I realized God's not using me with lost people because he doesn't think I care about them. <laughs> if I'm not willing to pray for them, why would he ever think that I care about them? So if you would maybe band together with uh, one or two other people in your local fellowship and say, let's, let's take this on as a project and I'll make a list, my top 10 list of people I really want to see saved. I'll make two copies of it. You make a list of your top 10 and make two copies of it. Maybe three of us will break into these little groups and I'll have my list and two of yours and I'll pray for those 30 people on a regular basis and I'll keep in touch with you. How's it going, right? Looking for opportunities to talk to those people. And it's quite astounding. We did this in Minneapolis years ago with a youth group and within a matter of a few short weeks, uh, one girl saw her grandmother saved and other, another fellow saw his best friend saved at school. And so it was. They, they just hadn't been focusing on this. And we moved from being passive about seeing people saved to being prayerful, being exercised. I think it's a great thing to do. Okay, number four. We need to move from confusing to clear. Now, when we worked with Good News on the Move and Cross Canada Cruisers, most of the guys that came to work with us had all been raised in good, solid Bible churches, churches that taught the gospel, that preached the gospel. But again, if we asked them to sit down with a piece of paper and put down in point form a clear, concise explanation of the gospel, they couldn't do it. They couldn't give their testimony. They just kind of stumbled around and it was just as what my dad used to call a dog's breakfast. It was a little bit of everything, this and that. And nobody, I mean, even the Christians who knew the gospel couldn't follow them. Like, where are you going with this? It was just sort of a random bunch of verses. So we need to move from uh, confusing to clear. You don't have to make it simple. You have to keep it simple. Now, maybe you've heard me do this before, but this came from a soul winner in Scotland, um, Campbell Morgan's mother, and she used John 3.16. And most people, a lot of people are familiar with John 3.16. Even if they don't know the verse, they've seen a sign at a sports event. John 3.16, why is it such a famous verse? Because it tells the story of the Bible in one sentence. It talks about God, talks about you, and in the middle is Christ, and how Christ can bring you to God. That's what it's about. And, and the basic ideas of John 3.16 are the gospel. So, she would say this. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, there are four positive action words. Let's listen for them. And very often when I start quoting it, the people quote it right along with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life okay listen now god loved so he gave i believe so i have god loved so he gave i believe so i have and very often i'll say you know that's not how most people quote john 316 in mississippi here's how they say it for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever goes to church and tries to be a good person and pays their tithes and sings in the choir, blah, 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 if they do it often enough and well enough, they got half a chance of sneaking in the back door of heaven. But that's not what it says. Let's say it together. God loved, so he gave. I believe, so I have. You can see their eyes light up. Right? I mean... It's happened hundreds of times. As I've shared the gospel, you can just see it. And so I say, now the question is, what does it really mean to believe? And just simply explain in the gospel. You're transferring your trust. This means, of course, Jesus not only died, he must have risen again because he's alive and he's the one who's offering you everlasting life right now so that you can know it. So get, whether it's the Romans Road or John 3.16, or some other little way of doing it, 
Get familiar with some good gospel verses. Memorize half a dozen verses or whatever it takes so that at a drop of a hat, you can do it. Uh, we've got some videos on, uh, on our website on how to share the gospel with one Bible verse. And just, you can just draw it right on a table napkin. Okay, number five. We need to move from frozen to friendly. Zig Ziglar, salesman, he used to say, I read the paper every day and the Bible every day. That way I know what both sides are up to. You see the Lord Jesus talking about the Tower of Siloam falling and current events, what people were burdened about, what they were thinking about. He was familiar with, uh, with fishing and uh, with farming. And, and so we can transition from any of these topics into the gospel. And so we need to care about what people care about. We need to understand um, the human personality, not just study the Bible, but study people so that we can interact with them, find common ground. Uh, we're building a bridge and we're building the bridge from where people are to where they need to go. We don't start with where we are. We start with there, where they are. I mean, no use sitting down beside a truck driver and saying, are you in the shadow of the great rock? Are you washed in the blood? Like, they, they have no idea what that means. So we have to start where people are and bring them to where they need to be. Um, we need to learn these, these fundamental skills. We need to learn to ask, to ask good questions. Ask questions about their background, where they're from, what they do, um, you know, any challenges in their life right now that we could pray for. We learn to, learn to ask. Secondly, we need to learn to listen. <laughs> we talk over people and we need to stop and hear how they respond. And then we need to respond to their response, not just brush it aside and say, well, actually, I, I don't want to talk about that. We, we need to respond to them where they're at. And then, if possible, we can pray with them and say, could I, you know, I find in my struggles, the best thing to do is take this to God because he's, he's able to, he's, he answers my prayers. And, uh, and maybe I could just pray with you. And even later, get back to them. How's it going? You know, if you get their email or, or their phone number to text them and say, hey, uh, how's it going with your uncle or what, whatever the problem is they're facing. So interacting with people simply at a human level is so important. We need to move from frozen to friendly. Okay, number six, we need to move from random to regular. All right, this is the importance of an undivided heart. Um, it saves you from unkind comments, from selfish acts, from political involvement, from flirting, from being distracted by materialism, from superficiality, all of these things that could um, minimize our effectiveness. When I go out into the day and say, I'm going out to represent Christ, to talk about Christ, looking for opportunities, you can't flirt and witness at the same time. <laughs> you can't get involved in political arguments and somehow bring up the gospel. It doesn't work. So uh, you can't antagonize and evangelize at the same time. So we need to move from uh, random to regular. I sometimes say, you know, when the Lord said, follow me, and I'll teach you how to be fishers of men. We think he meant sport fishing, you know, like you go out there and you catch one and then you talk about it for three months. <laughs> no, no, he was talking about commercial fishing. He was talking about getting out there, setting the nets, and going after souls. And that's hard work. It's long hours. You got to know the sea. You got to know the fish. You got to know uh, everything about fishing if you're going to really be successful. And we, we just can't do this sort of um, I, I, you know, I catch a fish once every three years and talk about it for the rest of my life. We've got to be moved from random to regular. And uh, I remember a fellow, I was speaking and talking about this. If you're going to be an ambassador and speak for God, speak for heaven, you can't be um, involved in political wrangles because it, um, it undermines your position undermines your ability to speak to everybody. God wants to save 
uh, conservatives as much as he wants to save liberals. He wants to save Republicans as much as he wants to save Democrats. And as soon as I take a political position, I cut off half my audience. We don't want to do that. Well, anyway, he was deeply offended. I found out later he was the principal fundraiser for the Republican Party in the state of Virginia. And he wrote me this blistering letter. But before I could answer it, um, within a day, I, I got a second letter with deep apologies. And he said, let me tell you what happened. I was so convicted about this. I went and resigned my position. But as I was there in the office, they said they accepted my resignation, but, uh, but they said there's uh, one of the principal donors in the state of Virginia that needs a ride to the airport. Could you take him to the airport? And I agreed to do that. He said, for the first time in my life, as we were riding along in that car, I felt the joy of an undivided heart. I was afraid to witness to this guy before because I thought it might affect how he donated money to the Republican Party. But now I just had one thing in mind. So if we can get past all these things like who cut me off in traffic or, or you know, how they treat me or they don't appreciate me or whatever, just get past all that and say, look, you know, you've seen this book, One Thing You, you Can't Do in Heaven. Uh, there are several things you can't do in heaven. You can't suffer for the Lord. You can't sacrifice for the Lord. There are lots of things you can't do in heaven, but one of them is you can't witness for the Lord. Everybody there, they know all the Bible answers, and they're all saved, right? So now's the time to do it. Okay, number seven. We need to move from dead ends to divine appointments. My grandfather, Robertson, he was just a master at this because he really cared about people. He loved people. And, uh, you know, his little phrase was, one thing led to another. He'd start with a conversation, and before you know it, bam, he was right in the middle of the gospel. I used to try that. It didn't work. You know, so, hey, how you doing? Good, fine. Me too, yeah. You from around here? Yeah, me too, yeah. Um, you working? No, actually, I'm out of, out of work right now. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, finally I'd pop the question, you know, and it was like I was asking them, do you have AIDS or leprosy or something? It was like... There was just this total shock. And, and I realized this is not good, you know. Um, my Christianity needs to be uh, an organic part of my Christian experience. It, it needs to be something that flows out of my life, not something that I'm, okay, I'm putting on my Christian hat now, and, uh, you know, now I'm going to be the witness for a while. No. The scripture says of the early believers, they went everywhere gossiping the gospel. They went everywhere evangelizing. They couldn't help it. Um, you know the old hymn that says, Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows, loving his Savior to tell what he knows. It's just overflowing of love and appreciation for what I've enjoyed about the Lord. And when I can live like that and do that, it comes across as natural. I'm not... I'm not hunting, you know, I'm not, I'm not after them. I'm just simply sharing. I'm just telling people, you know, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. And, and I'd like you to get in on it. That's all. So um, I, I had no end of dead ends. And, uh, you know, I used to think about this. And, and one day I was reading the scripture and I read about all these open doors in the Bible. And I thought to myself, you know, my Christianity, my soul winning, my witnessing is like banging my head against the wall. And there I am banging my head against the wall when all of a sudden the Lord speaks to me and says, uh, Nicholson, uh, I happen to know where the doors are. Would you be interested? <laughs> Man, it's a lot more fun going through an open door than it is trying to use your head as a battering ram. Way more fun. So I began to pray. I saw this. Uh, a, a door of utterance, so I might know how to speak. You ever pray for that? Paul said, we pray for that. We don't just assume we're going to know how to speak to people. A door of faith, so that people actually believe what we're saying, right? Um, um, a, a great door and effective, and there are many adversaries. That goes with the territory. The more effective you are in witnessing, the more opposition you'll have from the enemy. That should be encouraging. It's like, wow, he's taking us seriously. It's like, it's like the demon saying, Paul, we know, but who are you? Right? <laughs> Paul was a, a headliner in hell. They knew about him. They knew what he was doing. Does anybody even care or know what I'm doing in hell? So, 
we, we need to realize this, that God wants to open doors for us. If that's going to be true, we have to be spirit-filled and then spirit-led. You see, this is where even a little sin gets really expensive. If you're bumping along in the bottom and nobody takes you seriously as a Christian and you don't have any power with God or men, uh, a sin doesn't, it's a little heartburn, doesn't make any difference. But if you're walking with God and you're filled with the Spirit and God is maneuvering things and bringing people into your life and lives are being changed, all of a sudden sin gets really expensive, right? And that's the key to understand that when we're committed to living for the Lord uh, and we allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit, and all that simply means is that we give the Spirit access to every cupboard and every closet and every drawer in our lives. We're not playing games with Him. We're not pretending. We're, we're being honest with Him. And then we're asking Him to direct our steps and give us opportunities. You know, the difference between thanks for your opinion and I heard God speaking through you is monumental. Uh, whatever you say about Jonah, in chapter 3 we read, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. He cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed Jonah. Oh, no, wait. What does that say? So the people of Nineveh believed God. Proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. They believed that when Jonah opened his mouth, God was speaking. That's what we need. That's what you need. That's what I need. And that's going to happen if the Spirit of God is allowed access to our hearts and we're not playing games. When that happens, when we open our mouths, people hear the Word of God. All right, so four quick conclusions. Number one, Start where you are, but don't stay where you are. God doesn't expect you to be D.L. Moody or Billy Graham tomorrow. But of course, D.L. Moody and Billy Graham, they didn't start uh, at the finished product either. Moody was just a shoe salesman. He wasn't talking to anybody about the Lord. And Billy Graham was a farm boy the same way. So God worked with them, started with them where they were, and moved them on. So start where you are, but don't stay where you are. Number two, today's the day. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, we often use the verse in the gospel, behold, now is the accepted time, behold, now is the day of salvation. <laughs> but Paul, he's using it in talking to the servants of the Lord. And he's saying, if today's the day of salvation, what day is it we should tell people today's the day of salvation? Tomorrow? No, today. So we need to get with the program here and don't put this off. A lot of times it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll think about this. No, don't think about it. Kick into gear. Or maybe even tonight you can start by making those prayer lists, uh, talking to someone that you'll be willing to share this burden with and begin to pray together for. Um, look up some of those good gospel messages, simple ways to explain the gospel. Begin to think and ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I want to be honest with you and I want to start up right away on this because the devil's word is tomorrow. God's word is today. Okay, then number three. God will likely use your liabilities. Like if you say, well, I'm not eloquent. Yeah, Moses tried that, right? And God said, you just show up. I will be your mouth and your message. Um, I think of John Handley. He was severely abused as a child, and he has a terrible speech impediment. Like it goes on and on forever trying to spit out a word. You would never think that God would use John Hanley in reaching the Muslims in the south of France. But that's exactly what's happened. Um, <laughs> they're trying to help him. He's, he's trying to quote a Bible verse and they're trying to help him finish it. They feel sorry for the guy. A friend out in Prince Edward Island, he ended up in a terrible auto wreck. He's paralyzed in his legs. And he, he says, my wheelchair is the greatest uh, witnessing tool I've got. Nobody will walk away from me. Little children get away with things that adults wouldn't. Old people get away with things. You know, God uses our liabilities. So when you say, well, I can't do it for these reasons, 
you look at the descriptors of those that God uses, it's the weak. It's the people who are not eloquent, they're not powerful, they're not influential. Those are the kind of people God wants to use. And then finally, number four, realize there's room for everybody on the team. They're all different ways to share the gospel, and God wants to use all of us. Um, people talk about getting way out of their comfort zone. I don't think that's a good idea. When my arm gets way out of its comfort zone, bad things start to happen. God's given us a range of motion. Yes, our muscles will stretch a bit, but he wants to use us in our sphere for his glory. So, God encourage you. God bless you. I'm a living witness to the fact that God can use chickens and he can use you too. Let's just close in prayer. Father, as we have been thinking about this very important subject, we realize people around us are lost and dying and they need a savior. And we know how to be saved because we ourselves have been saved. Help us to have a burden for the lost, to pray for the lost, to look for opportunities with them, to love them and care for them, and then be ready to clearly and simply explain God's way of salvation. We ask your rich blessing on everyone who hears this little talk, that they might be inspired to do more of what God has given us to do, to speak well of Christ, to tell people the wonderful way of salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are so many wonderful resources for people who want to be involved in evangelism. Uh, I've been using these pens lately, a very nice pen from National Pen Company. They cost less than 50 cents a piece with a little stylus on the end, their gel pen, and um, I can get a Bible verse printed on there, included in the price. I have Nahum 1-7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. I had no idea we'd be in this coronavirus situation when I got that little verse, but everybody responds positively to it. Um, but you can find all sorts of good little materials, uh, gospel tracts, witnessing tools, and um, uh, some a year or so ago we produced uh, some daily devotionals which have been put into a book by Everyday Publications and Uplook called Seed Thoughts for Soul Winners. And in this book there are explanations of the gospel, uh, answers to often asked questions by unbelievers, um, witnessing tools, uh, opportunities, uh, testimonies, true life testimonies of people who got saved and so on. So lots of good help in this. Uh, you can get this online or you can buy the book. Um, I think it's free for a donation. Uh, you might want to think about that. Seed Thoughts for Soul Winners. Um, be sure and check out our gospel site, um, goodnewsnow.info, and also our granary site, Good News Granary, which provides some gospel resources. Thanks so much.